what we're going to do now is we're going to, we've talked about light as a wave. We've talked about its frequency, its wavelength, its speed, its amplitude. We've talked about the wave properties of light. Now we're going to move and think about the particle properties of light. What happens when we think of light as a particle as opposed to as a wave? What happens? So here's my question. We have a laser. Can I keep making this laser dot dimmer and dimmer and dimmer and dimmer and dimmer forever? Keep having it, for example. Make it half as bright, half as bright, half as bright. Can I do that forever? And this may seem like a very, you know, abstract philosophical question. I'm going to flip it on its head for you. Can I take a sample of water and keep reducing its amount forever? No. Eventually I get down to one water molecule and I'm done. This was the basis for the atomic theory. You can't separate matter forever. I'm just asking you the exact same question for a dot of light. Can I keep having it forever? And it turns out the answer is no. I can't. At some point, I reach the bottom. There's a smallest dimness. Just like there's a smallest amount of water you can have, there's a smallest amount of light you can have. And we call this smallest amount of light, we say it's a particle of light, and we call it a photon. Now, the first day, I introduced a bunch of symbols for E for electron, P for proton. For photon, we are going to use this symbol. No, it is not a Y. It is the letter gamma, the Greek letter gamma. If you want to write it by hand, it looks like that. It's a lowercase gamma. That's what I'm going to use for photon because I'm going to get tired of writing the word photon all the time. So what we can imagine this laser beam as being as a bunch of flow, we can think of it as a light wave where I change the amplitude to make it brighter or darker. Or we can flip that on its head and say it's a bunch of photons flying along together and to make it brighter or darker I change the number of photons. So already we're sort of bouncing back and forth between thinking of things as waves and particles. Turns out this photon image is really good when we think about light being absorbed from, by materials or emitted from materials. That's when thinking in terms of particles tends to be a good picture. Waves, on the other hand, tend to do really well when we're thinking about light flying through space. That's where waves tend to do well. Okay? So we listed the properties of an electron. We listed the properties of a proton. Let's go through the properties of the photon real quick. So we are now imagining light to be made up of little balls. But we are imagining them to be made up of little massless spheres. Little massless particles that travel at the speed of light, C. But even though they are massless, they still carry energy and momentum. I think we can all agree that this laser beam is carrying energy to it, you know, because if I hold this button long enough, the battery dies. So clearly there's energy being transferred. We'll talk about momentum in a second. So the energy of a single photon is related to the wave of the light. The energy of the photon is related to the frequency of the light wave through this expression, E equals HF, where H is Planck's constant. This is one of those, it's like the speed of light. It's just one of these numbers that seems to just pop up when you do physics, or the Boltzmann's constant. There's just these numbers that just pop up. Here's one of them, Planck's constant. You never need to memorize the number, I'll give it to you. But you can see the units are energy times time. Energy times time. Fun little factoid about Planck's constant. What's the kilogram currently defined by? What's the definition of the kilogram?
You were in my class, I told you this. I know, because I just gave that exact same lecture the other day. What's the kilogram? Yeah. Yeah, there's a cylinder sitting in France. There's a chunk of metal made of platinum and iridium sitting in a bell jar in Paris. And that's the kilogram. For the next year and a half, that will be true. Starting summer 2018, they are going to change that. It will no longer be based upon some little cylinder. It is, in fact, going to be based upon Planck's constant. You can see that that works by good old E equals mc squared. We've defined the speed of light. Joules are a unit of energy. Mass pops out. So they're going to redefine the kilogram in 2018 to be based upon Planck's constant. So photons, in addition to having energy, they also have momentum. And this is the part that tends to get folks. Because in 131, I told you that momentum was mass times velocity, which is mostly true. It's true as long as you're not going too fast. Start getting close to the speed of light, this will actually break down on you. You need a new, a new expression. But as long as you're going slow, this is fine. But clearly, this does not work for photons, because for photons, m is zero. So this wouldn't work. Special relativity has an answer. It's the momentum of a photon is the energy divided by the speed of light. And to answer whoever that was his question about E equals mc squared, E equals mc squared is only half the story. The full version <coughs> is that. So E equals mc squared is true as long as you're not moving. For a photon, the mass is zero. There you go. <coughs> what do you need? Momentum of a photon is energy divided by speed of light. Tried to think of an application for this. Couldn't come with like a practical biochemical or something application. So I just went for like, you know, off the wall cool. Uh, Bill Nye the science guy always makes things cooler. Um, launched what they call a solar sail back in 2015. And what's a solar sail? It's a big giant mirror that you launch into space. And the mirror, you have photons from the sun come in and then bounce and go back out. This photon undergoes a change in momentum. This was a unit three quiz question about the change in direction. There's a change in momentum because it's a vector. There's a 131 for you. So there's a change in momentum. Change in momentum implies a what from 131? Force, or more specifically, it implies a impulse. J equals delta P. So impulse implying a force. This thing flies off. So solar sail. There's an example of photons have momentum. <coughs> so now let's apply this. As usual, I'm going to do one, then I'm going to give you all a chance to crack at one. Okay? So we're going to start with a single photon of green light. Green light has a wavelength of 500 nanometers. That's a number that I'm not going to ask you to memorize, but I suspect by the end of the semester you probably have. So let's go and try and find the energy of this photon. Well, we know that E equals HF. That's our energy of a photon. But I don't have F. I have wavelength. But we do know that V, in this case C, because it's a light wave, equals lambda F. So F is C over lambda. Notice, have I put a number in yet? No. This is how you should do problems. Substituting that into there, we get E is HC over lambda. And now I'm done, and now I can put numbers in. 
6.626 times 10 to the minus 34, 3 times 10 to the 8th, and lambda, I need to convert to meters. And plug that all together, and I get an energy of, where is that number? Ah, there it is. 3.98 times 10 to the minus 19 joules. Okay, fine. That's an annoyingly ugly number to look at. That's an annoyingly ugly number to look at. So I'm going to introduce a new unit, the electron volt, also called the EV. Also, I'm sure I will inevitably call it the EV, all the same thing. We'll talk about where this unit comes from later, but what do you need to know right now? It's a unit of energy. It's just a unit of energy. One EV is 1.602 times 10 to the minus 19 joules. Again, I would give you the conversion. So it's just a tiny amount of energy, just like a calorie is a unit of energy, or an erg is a unit of energy, or a joule is a unit of energy. An EV is a unit of energy. It's a nice unit of energy, though, because it tends to work well when you get down to atomic sizes. So how much, for example, I need 13.6, about 13 and a half EV of energy to remove an electron from a hydrogen atom. So just sort of give you a reference point of what an EV is. So let's convert this. So we got 3.98 joules. We know 1 EV is 1.602 times 10 to the minus 19 joules. Joules cancel, and I'm left with an energy of this photon of 2.48 EV. Questions on the energy part? All right, then we can move on to the momentum, where we know that momentum is E over C. When in doubt, go back to joules and everything. Makes your life easier. And you've got a momentum of kilogram. 1.32, 10 to the minus 27. Okay? All right. You've now had a chance. You've seen me do it. Key points of my process. Work in symbols to the end. Work in symbols to the end. All right. Your turn. Going around, looks like a lot of folks are getting it. Looks like a lot of folks are getting it. So, debrief it real quick. E is HF. C is lambda F. E is HC over lambda. Plug in your numbers, and you will get the 1.7, and convert, and you will get the 1.77 EV. One thing, watching as I go around, I'll borrow your calculator for just yeah. a second. The way I'm seeing people solve this is by doing this and not putting pen to paper. Don't do that. You might be able to do it with this problem, but start getting into the habit of solving this out symbolically and in a neat way. The problems are going to get more involved as we go along, and being able to do this is going to be helpful. Practice it while it's easy, okay? Practice it while it's relatively easy so you've got the skills in hand when it gets tougher. Questions on this? Yeah? Could you use the 2.6 to find the wavelength of whatever you have with Ah, you are... 
a pr you could, oh, say, okay, blah, 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 start over. Her question was, can you use the 2.6 EV to figure out a corresponding wavelength? Yes, you can. But does that answer the question I'm looking to answer? Because the question I'm looking to answer is, can I have 2.6 EV of 700 nanometer light? So you've now started to ask a question about a different color. When I change the wavelength, I'm now changing the color. I've changed the kind of light. So yes, you can, but it doesn't help you here. Good question, though. So now we know that the energy of one photon is 1.7. <laughs> All right. Let's, give, let's see what you've come up with. On the count of three. One, two, three. Looks like most of you got it. Correct answer is? One more go at that. Correct answer is? No. Thank you. There's like 300 and some odd of you in here. I expect things to be loud. No, I cannot. Someone who answered no, why not? How do I get it to work? Why does it not work? You're up. Perfect. You can't have a decimal amount of photons. One photon is 1.77 EV. If one photon is... 1.77 EV, then 2.6 EV is about a photon and a half. You can't have half a photon any more than you can have half a water molecule. Same sort of a thing. You can only have them in integer numbers. Just like you can only have water molecules in integer numbers. You can't have a molecule and a half. It doesn't work. Questions on this? Yes, sir. Yes. Excellent. So his question was, if this 2.6, if it wasn't 2.6, if it was double 1.77, could I have that amount of energy? Yes. It'd be two photons. I can have one photon. I can have two photons. I can't have a photon and a half. Double of 1.77 is what, like three-ish? A little more than three? So I can have three-ish EV because that is a full two photons. No, three and a half. Three and a half. Y'all know I can't do arithmetic. <laughs> 